I think this will be a fairly gentle presentation to start the morning. Um, nothing too demanding technically, I don't think. Um, uh, my, my thanks to Rolf uh, for the invitation and uh, an, an element of apology for having changed the subject uh, from the original suggestion, as I know others have done. Um, what I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, is uh, approximately described uh, by the title. Uh, it's essentially an overview uh, of uh, where we are in terms of land use transport interaction modeling practice uh, in Great Britain at present, um, and some reflections on how that relates uh, to the different themes that we've been discussing over the past two days. Uh, and so uh, th this is very much uh, th the view uh, from the uh, applications in practice end uh, of the, the, the modeling spectrum. Uh, and uh, it, it is uh, unashamedly uh, national uh, in, in, in perspective. Uh, we, 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 are, uh, we have got uh, other work outside uh, Great Britain uh, but uh, for simplicity and focus, uh, I'll be concentrating uh, on, on the British situation. So, uh, the British context is uh, quite demanding uh, in terms of the range of major decisions uh, that uh, have to be made at the moment. E even setting aside uh, little issues like uh, whether we remain within the European Union or not, uh, which uh, continues to occupy a certain amount of attention. Uh, there are a lot of uh, major investment proposals uh, that are under consideration at the moment. Uh, so uh, those are illustrated are, in fact, Crossrail 2, uh, which is another major, very major rail scheme uh, for connecting suburban railways through the centre of London following on from the Crossrail 1 uh, scheme, uh, which is just approaching, approaching completion. Uh, th this is a second scheme from uh, northeast uh, to southwest, which if it goes ahead uh, would be completed uh, in about 15 years' time. Uh, there is the uh, high-speed rail proposals for a uh, line known as HS2 from London uh, north and northwestwards to Birmingham, Manchester and Leeds, uh, possible extensions of that, uh, and a whole range of proposals uh, for further fast or very fast rail uh, systems uh, in the north of England connected to that. Um, there are a whole range of proposals for new crossings of the Thames in southeast England, uh, both in East London, uh, one of which will replace uh, a ferry that has been there for some hundreds of years uh, and additional lower crossings in addition to the bridges and tunnels we have. Uh, and th there's the question uh, of um, the expansion of runway capacity uh, where the government has just announced a, a decision in principle uh, that that should involve expansion at Heathrow, whether a new runway or an extended run runway uh, still to be decided. Uh, we have a, uh, a National Infrastructure Commission uh, that has been set up to advise on these and the whole raft of other questions, including power, uh, water, and so on. Uh, and that itself has already uh, got into a complicated situation, having been, fir having, having been first announced uh, that it would have a statutory uh, role in the planning system, uh, and then that proposal has been withdrawn again. And all of this is against the background of a major uh, continuing uh, and worsening housing crisis, uh, failure to build uh, anything like the number of dwellings uh, that is required, uh, which means, amongst other things, uh, that many of these uh, transport proposals uh, are also being considered very closely for their potential impact uh, on uh, housing supply uh, and in the Crossrail 2 uh, case, which I know in most detail, uh, a lot of the interest, a lot of the potential benefit uh, is if that makes it realistic in both market and planning terms uh, to have a lot more housing in uh, and around London. Um, 
the way in which uh, transport and other investments are controlled also varies uh, within Britain. Uh, planning and surface transport uh, within Scotland and Wales are devolved to their respective governments, uh, though financial devolution in general is lagging behind. Uh, in England, uh, control over major planning proposals and a wide range of transport proposals uh, remains highly centralised. Uh, basically, uh, local authorities of different kinds are responsible for putting forward proposals, uh, but there is very little that they can do uh, without central government permission or, or, or central government finance. Basically, the situation can be seen as set up uh, so that local government uh, takes the criticism for failures and central government, uh, central ministers, uh, can take the credit for any achievements. Um, this is perhaps changing a little in that there are initiatives for devolution to city regions, um, which involve uh, directly elected mayors for those city regions, uh, following the examples of Ken Livingston and, rather less inspiringly, Boris Johnson in London. Um, uh, in most cases, indirectly elected bodies known as combined authorities uh, to whom the mayors will be accountable. Um, these are indirectly ele elected because there's a lot of resistance uh, to creating uh, direct city region, uh, directly elected city region bodies, uh, which have been tried and proved remarkably unpopular before. Uh, and interestingly, there will be, uh, or the proposed to be, new borrowing powers uh, and uh, devolution of some tax revenues, particularly from property tax, uh, out of which uh, the mayors or their successors uh, will hope to, to repay uh, borrowing uh, for new investment. Uh, and there is uh, a substantial program uh, of support uh, to kick-start uh, some of these investment programs uh, under the general heading of uh, city deals. Um, the one of those, some of those do still extend uh, into Scotland. Uh, it was interesting that by an extraordinary coincidence, uh, the uh, one for Glasgow was uh, arranged so that uh, Her Majesty's Treasury were able to announce what they presented as a £900 million pound grant uh, to Glasgow at the last possible moment before the Scottish independence referendum. I'm sure that was a pure coincidence. Um, in terms of what all of this means uh, in uh, analysis, uh, there is a lot of focus uh, now on the economic impact uh, of transport and planning proposals. Um, this is somewhat convoluted in that the, uh, that is the, the political interest uh, in showing uh, that better transport, better housing supply uh, will lead to economic growth. Uh, though the formal requirements for analysis uh, that are set out uh, alternately by the Treasury and for transport, elaborated in a lot more detail uh, by the Department for Transport, uh, they are still focused on welfare rather than uh, GVA itself. Uh, and that's a, that, that leads to some, uh, a lot of issues about reconciling the political will for economic growth uh, with the formal analytical requirements. Uh, transport modelling itself uh, has, for the most part, remained uh, very conventional. We are still plodding on uh, in the vast majority of cases uh, with uh, conventional aggregate, more or less, four-stage models. Um, but along the way, uh, the levels of detail that are required uh, in terms of networks uh, in terms of the uh, breakdown of travel demand, uh, of user types, uh, and uh, in the, particularly in the cases where any kind of toll or charge is involved uh, by income groups, uh, there's a lot more demand essentially for disaggregation. And as an inevitable consequence, uh, the transport models uh, have got slower, uh, despite computers obviously having got faster. Um, as an example of that, uh, again, so that I should apologize for picking on uh, my firm's clients, but they're the cases that I know best. Uh, Transport for London have a large scale, pretty conventional uh, four stage type model uh, uh, for London known as LTS, 
uh, because it originally came from the London Transportation Studies. Uh, th th this has been around since about 1962, though it is fair to say that the model has been uh, comprehensively rebuilt uh, several times. Um, that uh, was uh, running for a number of years, uh, taking about 13, 14 hours uh, to do one complete run of the transport model for one uh, forecast year. Uh, the latest improvements, uh, I, I say that as uh, neutrally as I can, uh, have extended the runtime from being essentially half a day uh, to about three days. And no, n nobody seems to regard this as an issue. However, uh, the demands for analysis of alternative investment programs more widely uh, particularly in the context of things like the city deals, which are not just about transport, but in, can involve uh, regeneration, flood defences, uh, environmental uh, interventions of different kinds. Uh, th those, and, and a, a lot of transport decisions, uh, have to work to decision-making timescales uh, that are set uh, according to political requirements, uh, not analytical ones. Um, so we, we have had the situation, for example, <coughs> where we were asked to find the optimum combination uh, of something like 40 different investment proposals um, in a period of five or six weeks uh, in a situation where the uh, transport model uh, was taking about six hours ago uh, to run. Um, and clearly, actually, optim formally optimizing uh, 40, the combination of uh, permutations, combination of 40 schemes uh, is, is quite impossible. Uh, it would involve something like factorial 40 uh, different runs of the model, which is uh, quite clearly absurd. But e even to do a much more heuristic analysis uh, of uh, the, the obvious candidates and of each scheme individually, and then the obvious promising possibilities, uh, that couldn't be done. Uh, with the uh, um, transport models that were available. And you know, th that was by no means the worst case in terms of the transport modeling uh, timescale. We've got others that take up to a week. Uh, Ten days has been rumored in some cases, uh, which makes uh, any kind of model running program uh, almost impossible. Uh, and so there's a major conflict, really, between the way that transport modelling has been developed uh, and the growing interest uh, in uh, formal analysis of how transport com com contributes uh, to, to land use uh, and economic development. Uh, so that's all about the context. Just to go back into a little bit into the kind of uh, modelling that uh, we've been developing and how this has moved forward over time. Uh, we're working very, uh, mainly, or almost entirely, with our own Delta package uh, that we've developed over the past 20 years. Uh, and this is very much in the sort of stepwise dynamic uh, tradition uh, following several other models that have been mentioned, uh, that the land use model, land use economic model, uh, is dealing with changes over time uh, in one year steps. Uh, and as the diagram suggests, uh, we've always worked, had the practice of running with the transport model at intervals. Uh, the most successful models um, in terms of modeling land use transport interaction and getting the you know, most reasonable results um, have been those where the transport model has been run most frequently. And the most frequent that we have managed is to run the transport model in alternate years. Um, again, it's obvious if it's going to take uh, days to run the transport model. Uh, you can't do that uh, when working in this kind of situation. And this, of course, is just one five-year sequence. Uh, the, the minimum period that we're asked to look at uh, is 20 years. And, and in some cases, uh, it, the, the forecasts are required uh, for 50 years because of the low discount rate uh, and the importance uh, of benefits that are accruing in the very distant future. So you, you have to imagine uh, this diagram extending uh, right around the room to the back door uh, and how long it would take to run uh, with the transfer model uh, every, every fifth year or so. Um, the, the, the model itself uh, is a combination of uh, land use economic model 
Um, very briefly, we have a relatively detailed zonal model in the centre, uh, which is dealing with household and job location in the property markets, uh, and a very simple model of the labour market. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, we have a model of uh, longer distance migration, which works at a higher spatial level. So uh, this, uh, I haven't mapped this, but this is an example of uh, a, a multi-scale uh, model of the kind that Michael Wegner was speaking about. Um, on the left-hand side of the diagram, we have the higher level economic model, uh, which is representing uh, investment uh, and trade and production gives rise to labor demand. Uh, the, the trade and production component within that uh, is a spatial input-output model uh, similar to the one uh, uh, that was appeared in the Mi Plan and PICA's pack packages in the past uh, and that uh, Ing Jin uh, mentioned uh, yesterday. And what we have relatively recently, over the last two or three years, added to that uh, is additional modelling of uh, productivity effects. So this is looking at the kind of relationship uh, between accessibility, agglomeration, uh, and uh, GVA per worker and wages uh, that Kai Axhausen uh, was uh, speaking about uh, in, in his presentation. And so th this is very much a hybrid model uh, built uh, from uh, a number of different ideas, and in fact what we have done is to take the conventional uh, fixed economy spatial input-output model uh, and to put an element of adjustment uh, in productivity through production functions uh, on top of that. Uh, so we are not in the business of producing our own entirely freestanding uh, economic forecasts. Uh, we initially control the model to a given forecast that is agreed uh, with the client, well, usually, uh, and then model the, imp the, the marginal impact uh, of transport change uh, on productivity and the overall growth of the economy in some cases, the overall growth of population as well, uh, as, as a result uh, of the improvements uh, in accessibility and agglomeration, which well-chosen uh, transport schemes uh, will create, if that's the objective, uh, and which may be amplified or indeed damped down uh, by the, the choice of planning policies to go with it. Uh, what we've had to do in this case uh, is to take really a step back from strict land use transport interaction. Um, and you'll notice that in this diagram, uh, the link from transport uh, to land use economy uh, is in one direction only. Uh, and we've <coughs> uh, th th this has been uh, a result of the impracticability of actually running the transport model at all uh, in interaction uh, with the land use model uh, in some of the cases uh, where it is where it takes too long, uh, and indeed, uh, not only is the, the computing time uh, constraint, but these very slow transport models uh, often require a lot of staff time, which may simply not be available uh, for the added uh, land use transport into an action analysis. Uh, and to try to clarify what we're doing here, uh, we have invented the term uh, LUMIT model, the land use model influenced by transport uh, to try and make a distinction from uh, standard uh, LUTI modelling. And uh, that, for better or worse, uh, uh, seems to be catching on uh, as a term that uh, some government departments, uh, or some people in Department for Transport in particular, recognise as making that particular distinction. I'll come back to that, perhaps, if, if we need to go further into the, the economic workings. Um, the other thing that we've been doing is considering that uh, working with fixed transport uh, is just not always a reasonable uh, solution. Uh, and after resisting the idea for some 20, 25 years, uh, we've finally gone down the path of adding our own element of transport modelling into the Delta package. Uh, we had always taken the view uh, that the world is full of transport consultants, uh, some of them are very good, um, and that there was absolutely no need for us to invent our own uh, transport model. But if uh, those transport models that are available to us are, are getting slower and slower, uh, taking days rather than hours when we're being expected to do things more in a timescale of minutes, 
then we, we, we've had to go down the path of developing uh, what we've called the, the highly strategic transport model. Uh, and again, uh, Kai Axhausen sort of foreshadowed this uh, before uh, in talking about uh, speed flow relationships at a complete sort of city or region wide level. Uh, we haven't gone quite that far, uh, but what we are doing uh, is essentially modeling uh, destination and mode choice and doing a very simple uh, loading of traffic uh, on into areas, so not onto links, but into different areas of the city uh, and applying area speed flow relationships uh, to look at the general pattern changes in congestion uh, that may result uh, from major changes in land use. And this is very much, this is not intended to compete with the detailed link and junction-based transport models. Uh, it is intended to give a first approximation of the congestion that may be generated uh, if uh, land use uh, and uh, indeed transport schemes are successful in bringing about uh, economic and physical regeneration uh, in particular parts of cities, especially as the interest both in regeneration and agglomeration tends to mean that there's a strong preference for achieving regeneration, outright growth, uh, in centres of cities where congestion uh, is uh, already an issue. So uh, we've got back to having uh, some, a full land use transport interaction uh, diagram uh, with this very highly strategic transport model taking uh, minutes, we hope to get it down to seconds, uh, to run uh, in, instead of hours and days. Uh, so uh, that is w where uh, we, we, we've got to in relation to looting modeling, the role of transport modeling. And I think, uh, again, you'll see strong connections uh, with uh, what Michael Wegener was saying uh, on Tuesday afternoon uh, about the uh, speed of model. Uh, and. Uh, I'd very much emphasise uh, the, you know, the, the value of models depends enormously on, not on, just on what they can do, uh, but whether they can do it in a timely manner. Uh, if it's going to take six weeks to do a model run and to do a single run, then in most cases uh, that just makes the model completely irrelevant. So, going back a little way towards uh, Rolf's original question, uh, what role for micro-simulation in all of this? About a decade ago, uh, we did develop a micro-simulation uh, version of the Delta package known as uh, Sim Delta. Um, it was, uh, we haven't actually run it for some time, so there's a question mark around the is. Uh, could be done, it should be work. Uh, a micro in its treatment of households, uh, household members, uh, but it was still aggregate uh, in space and, and indeed in transport. It was there. It's actually a Lumit model before we invented the term. Um, one of the points, again, uh, is about the, the role of parcel level modeling. And whilst a little bit of that has been done uh, in academic contexts uh, in Britain, uh, there has certainly been uh, no interest in it um, at, at a, a governmental level, certainly not that, that I'm aware of. Um, and so, uh, we have perhaps avoided going down the path of starting on parcel level uh, land use modeling uh, and stepping back from it, uh, as Kai did. We, we, we've not actually been there at all. Uh, but there are some lessons from the uh, Sim Delta experience, which I think are worth mentioning. Um, from our work with that, which was a project over two or three years, uh, we found that there were benefits uh, the, the oft, often claimed benefits uh, in terms of flexibility of variables, functions, and so on, are real uh, if uh, the project has the resources to do a number of things. And, and of course, if the, if the context uh, is appropriate, uh, it may not always, uh, if, if one is committed to doing a series of model runs on a consistent basis, uh, stopping to add in other variables is clearly not on. But the, the issues of ensuring that additional variables that are independent at one point in the system uh, can be forecast. I think uh, Eric, for one, made this point uh, in relation to, to, to iLoot. Uh, there's also the question of whether we're actually implementing and calibrating functions 
uh, that go beyond uh, conventional logic models. Um, I argue that un unless we are moving uh, into different kinds of models or, or to those models that are infeasible uh, at an aggregate level, uh, then uh, we're, we're not actually achieving very much. And there's also the matter of the other complications uh, that arise. Uh, anybody recognize the, uh, the still from the film? Yes, yes. Uh, th th this went down in the, uh, in, in the history of the firm as, as a problem that caused a great deal of puzzlement. Uh, the model uh, crashed r r repeatedly uh, with difficulty of uh, processing the, the key adult. Uh, what we found was that the uh, uh, demographic model, not, not inevitably, sooner or later, uh, it would uh, forecast the untimely death of a single parent, uh, leave an orphan or orphans uh, in a dwelling. Uh, this was something that uh, hadn't been programmed for, and the program would promptly collapse. And that kind of unexpected complication uh, proved uh, re remarkably time-consuming. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if that is borne out by other micro-simulation experience or whether we were just you know, not terribly adept at it, but uh, it, uh, <coughs> it was certainly memorable. Uh, the, the downsides to micro-simulation um, are really around the, the, the Monte Carlo characteristics and the use of random or, or, or pseudo-random number strings. Uh, one of the uh, issues that arose uh, was significant problems uh, in model testing. Uh, you get a problem you know, that, such as, uh, the, the, the demographic pro, um, process leaving you with an orphan, uh, uh, the, the, the sole occupant of a dwelling is a five-year-old, which is something you haven't anticipated. Uh, you, you make a minor tweak uh, to try to deal with that situation. Um, I, I think we took the King Herod approach of just losing the five-year-old, I'm afraid. Um, and uh, you go back and you find that the problem has gone away, but it hasn't gone away because you've dealt with the problem. It's gone away because you've used the random numbers in a slightly different sequence, uh, and you don't have the orphan anymore. Uh, you, you may have some very, very peculiar household somewhere else that's going to give you a new problem instead. Um, and we ended up uh, dealing with that. I'm, I'm sure we're reinventing wheels here, but uh, it's not something that anybody mentioned to us in advance. Uh, basically adopting a system of uh, moving away from using the ran pseudo-random numbers being generated by the computer as it went along to creating, in effect, uh, old-fashioned tables of random numbers, you know, like the printed ones that some of us uh, remember using when we st first started on this kind of thing, um, and setting the model up so that uh, for in a given test, a given decision would refer to a particular position in this table, and hence if we use the same table, uh, we would reproduce uh, the, the same effect, and we could make sure that that wretched child got orphaned yet again. Um, and for, you know, for testing purposes, that, that was essential. Uh, then there are the bigger issues, which again, Michael Wegener has alluded to and repeated, uh, written about um, on in, in a number of times, at a point which merits in insistence uh, which is the issue about stochastic variation in results uh, and uh, how many times we have to run the model uh, in order to be sure uh, that we are getting robust results, especially where there is uh, interest uh, not just in the overall uh, impact of a policy but what, in what it is doing locally. And you know, whatever the appraisal method, the overall decision to be made, uh, it is inevitable that where we are introducing uh, transport or planning schemes uh, which are local to particular uh, places, you know, S-Bahn lines have stations in specific places, planning permission is given for a particular land, uh, it, it is essential that the model should produce uh, reasonable and uh, reliable results uh, for the locations affected. If it doesn't, then... Uh, the users of the model results are not going to give it any attention. Uh, and the numbers of model runs that are needed uh, to produce robust results are high. And conventional view is that you need to do 30 rep repetitions of each run. 
if you're doing a comparison, that is, of course, 30 of each. Uh, Harry Timmermans has worked on this uh, and come up with some positively frightening figures, uh, arguing that, in fact, the real numbers are in the hundreds or thousands uh, to get reliable, detailed results. Uh, and so you know, even if we sort out our, our transport modeling pro problem, uh, the, the need to repeat uh, microsimulation uh, many times uh, is, uh, at the moment, uh, an infeasible practical challenge, uh, very difficult to justify uh, to potential clients and leaves us working uh, very much with aggregate models. Uh, that said, um, I think the use of microsimulation is still very strongly indicated for research aimed at better understanding of the processes of urban change, even while it's strongly contraindicated for policy application work uh, where clients are jumping up and down uh, wanting results yesterday morning. Uh, there's a potentially valuable way forward, which I think may uh, link these uh, two different worlds, uh, and that is uh, the use of microsimulation in research and to link the two by using outputs from well-calibrated and tested microsimulation models to produce synthetic data uh, on which aggregate models, uh, much faster models, uh, can be calibrated for use uh, in particular situations. Uh, we've done a little bit of that in terms of demographic transitions uh, using a fairly detailed demographic model, uh, complete with orphans, uh, to forecast changes in uh, household structure uh, and then using uh, the results of that to calibrate uh, a much simpler model of household transitions, you know, saying that this proportion of young single people will form couples each year, this proportion of young couples become couples with children, or indeed will, will, will split up again uh, each year, and so on, based on a much more detailed model. Uh, that, that has proved uh, quite successful. Uh, we haven't as yet found uh, other ways of adopting that method, uh, but I hope we will, not, ne with, not necessarily with our own microsimulation modeling in future. Uh, so that's trying to bring together the land use, transport, uh, microsimulation from a sort of current practical point of view. Uh, I, I hope that has been of interest. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, uh, try and answer questions, and we're very happy to discuss uh, any ideas uh, as to how uh, we could uh, draw further on the range of microsimulation and other research uh, that we've been discussing. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, that, that, that was uh, about future plans uh, in the labor market and the, the high strategic transfer model. Uh, since you pointed out, <laughs> so I, I, was, I was watching the time. Uh, the, I think uh, there were two things here which I thought needed further attention on the transport modeling side, even at a very highly aggregate level. Uh, one about uh, travel time reliability, which has been mentioned, uh, though I think uh, the, 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 the view is that it still remains very much in the, the, the too difficult category for explicit treatment. Uh, the, the other, the, the bee in my bonnet, uh, I apologize to those of you who've heard this buzzing before, uh, which I keep on about, uh, is the question of car parking, uh, the importance of car parking uh, as a constraint uh, on car travel, and uh, 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 hence I is a major element of supply uh, in uh, transport modeling, um, especially in you know, British cities where you know, car parking uh, in, in city centres is, is not necessarily uh, that readily available. Uh, also, as an element of land, uh, land use demand and uh, for more consideration uh, of car parking in both contexts, especially given the way in which car parking supply uh, may change in future uh, as we move uh, from a situation where we have a lot of old development that was built with high car parking standards to new development uh, which is being built to much lower provision of car parking uh, per unit of space, uh, so which has uh, important consequences both for the uh, economics of development uh, and for the users and the, the resulting transport patterns. Sorry. That's, <laughs> that was going back into the aggregate modeling, but uh, that was... Thank you very much. Th this is fascinating to see someone who has experience and has done both.
had gone back and forth. Question, comments? <coughs> Just a real quick comment. I was I was very uh, interested in your comment about orphans. Uh, in Ilut, we had the same problem, and uh, we're, we were fortunate. We kept track of extended families, so the first thing we try to do with orphans is find either an adult sibling or, a, or an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent to attach the, the orphan to. Uh, but, but, yeah, I mean, these are the sorts of things that jump up and bite you that you just don't expect until you uh, until you do things uh, I would just echo the importance of parking too I think uh, <laughs> having just spent uh, the summer trying to find parking in cities like Bath and so forth as I was driving around <laughs> it's a challenge but, but more generally as a policy tool I think in general in transportation something we, we often ignore um, to Indeed. our peril yeah. <laughs> uh, but, well I mean a long time ago, 19, in the 1980s, we did a fair bit of uh, mode choice modeling for commuting into the downtown Toronto, and parking supply and price was by far the dominant explanatory variable. Uh, we, we, had, we, we, we had unit elasticities on, on, on walking time and, and fares uh, at parking prices um, for, for uh, auto drive. Um, so it's, it's, it's not the lowly, it's, it's, a, very, it's a, very, a very key policy variable. If I can just say, the, the, the extended family point is a very interesting one. Um, we were working with data, uh, with um, a population which was based on the sample of anonymized records. So we had a real sample, um, but what that didn't give us was anything about connections between different households. And one of the things that we know from uh, reading the, the migration literature and trying to draw on that uh, is that within Britain uh, there is an interesting tendency for retired people uh, to move towards areas of higher job opportunities, which is obviously makes no sense at all from the point of view of the retired people themselves, but we're fairly sure it, it is to do with active households moving and essentially taking uh, their aged relatives with them to, to live still as separate households uh, nearby. We, no, we've done this ourselves with my um, mother-in-law and sister-in-law moving from a, a high unemployment area to a much more expensive high employment area simply so that we could just look after them. Uh, and that is the kind of thing which I think could very well be modelled you know, would be captured if you had representative representation of the extended families and is completely untreatable otherwise. It's a general and possibly naive <clears throat> remark, but um, isn't a, a future in which we have more autonomous vehicles with more vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, more vehicle-to-infrastructure communication, um, so that uh, autonomous vehicles are aware of where there is parking availability? Isn't the parking problem going to diminish when you're looking at 20 to 50 year time horizons? Very probably, yes. Um, I was hearing at European Transport Conference a, a few weeks ago uh, of a, a, a study that had been done in Lisbon, which estimated that you know, a, a maximum take up of autonomous vehicles would reduce the demand for central area car parking uh, by something like 95%. That, that was on the basis of using them as shared vehicles, effectively as, as, as shared taxis. Um, uh, the, so yes, it, it, it would reduce the demand. It, it raises interesting questions of, of what else uh, we, we, we would do with the space. Um, it, it, it would make bigger, difficult, di bigger differences uh, to cities outside London, I suggest, uh, than, than to London, where the parking supply is relatively less important uh, relative to the scale of the commuting. Sorry, I think I might have just jumped in. Uh, on the, the productivity side, one thing we've been looking at um, with LSE is, is kind of how productivity may be affected by climate change in the future. So they've done a study on um, how, how many more breaks you need given uh, higher temperatures. And if you're an indoor and outdoor worker, um, you need different uh, levels of under, I don't know if it's an EU regulation or whether it's just a recommendation. But either way, as the temperatures increase and as the, the um, number of heat waves we expect to see every year increases, then that productivity is obviously impacted. But there's obviously then, that's the direct impact that at the workplace, so there's also the, the impact at the home. Mm -hmm. So if people don't get as much rest in the evening, their productivity 
decreases. So, that, so both of those we can look at an aggregate level, the number of heat waves days per year, and see how that may affect productivity spatially as well, because we have kind of five kilometer uh, models of heat waves over the course of a year. So that might be quite an interesting link between climate change and productivity in a direct way, but in an indirect way, there's obviously then the reliability story that I mentioned the other day yes. that I'm quite interested in. So, and I noticed you had a diagram where you had accessibility linked directly to productivity at some point. Uh, your kind of so that, that was the one I another one I skipped, but yes, yes. But th so th th this is trying to. Sorry, I was going to say that that link there maybe the reliability thing again. If we one of the things we looked at was the number of times that the temperature rose above a point that you expect to see rail buckle events happening on the rail network. And there may be a link there that as you see more and more rail buckle events or speed limits imposed in the anticipation of rail buckle events, you may see a link to a diminished productivity as well. So uh, these I, are tiny I, I, I'm, I'm sure one would, yes. Actually, that, that's a very good point of how reliability would of, of the transport infrastructure would affect not just uh, traveller preferences, but the actual ability to turn up to work on time or, or, or at all. Yeah, that, uh, that's a good point. Thank you. Okay, another question, Mackay. Yeah, about this this um, stochasticity. I usually call this signal to noise ratio. So the the signal should be a lot stronger than the noise. Yes. Uh, uh, and then I usually tell my people to to start with a policy measure that's like ten times more strong than what you do in reality. So so like have a ten times higher road pricing or make the road ten times as wide as as planned in the capacity or something, and then kind of ease into what's the real policy measure and see if, if you still see something. It, this is a somewhat playful approach to these things. Is, uh, can you say anything about this from a consulting perspective? Is this like totally useless or can we do this in academics but not in politics or how, what's your opinion? It, it would be interesting and certainly on occasions we do something similar, n not f for reasons of stochastic variation, but just to illustrate um, to, to clients uh, what kind of impact they might expect uh, from uh, the, 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 the biggest possible intervention, or the, what, what put, put in the, uh, the, the reductions in, in travel time, generalized cost, that they might possibly hope to get from the best possible rail scheme between two cities uh, and, and see what that does. And you know, if, if, if that is of interest, then we work with them to, to refine those inputs. Um, I said the, the issue with uh, uh, signal to noise ratio is at what point do we say this, is, th this question cannot be answered, that the, the model cannot detect uh, the, the, the impact uh, of, of this particular intervention. And I, I think if we're working with a, uh, a stochastic model and a small number, you know, a limited number of model runs, uh, there would be quite important, uh, what to the client, uh, important policies, where we would say, have to say, we, we cannot reliably detect this. Um, you know, we, we do find that we're in the position where a lot of the results that we're producing are you know, perhaps certainly at, at the city level are to clients uh, significant changes, for example, in employment, uh, even if they're small percentages. And uh, to, uh, to, to have a system which you know, reliably, uh, no, system which, which does reliably calculate the small effects of small changes uh, is uh, in, in informative you know, because it's especially in cases where we are dealing with uh, op uh, informally optimizing a, a package of investment. Some of those investments will be very large ones uh, which might come out fairly clearly at least in terms of their aggregate impact uh, from a, a, a micro simulation model. Uh, others will be quite small, um, and uh, to say you know, th this makes an insignificant difference, uh, it, it's, it's not really worth pursuing, or you know, it's very cheap, it's harmless, but it's not going to be a major part of, of, the, of the program, uh, th that is a valid answer. To say that because this is small, 
we cannot say anything about it at all because, because of the signal to noise ratio, I, I, I think it would be an unacceptable answer for a lot of clients. So, um, it, I, I, I would, in, in, at a kind of intellectual level, I wish it was otherwise because I, I, I see the point of, <laughs> of, of Monte Carlo micro simulation, but uh, uh, from a, a practical point of view, a, a deterministic system is uh, pretty much essential. I have a follow-on question. If I just see this slide. Um, how do we, or how does Delta actually cope with the churn of firms? Because clearly firms get replaced through price pressures on the, on the uh, rental market. They get mm -hmm. replaced through increasing wage rates. So how does Delta actually cope with this problem that you will have a completely different, well, not completely, but you will have a substantially changed firm population as well as a population of people? Because in many cases, it's the change, that churn, which produces the political resistance. The? Resistance. Mm -hmm. they, they, they would be happy if the existing firms became more productive, but in many cases, it will be new firms it will not be the same tenants anymore, but it will be new tenants. So how do we cope with that aspect? How, to what extent are, is Delta or are the clients actually interesting in finding out what turnover will this produce? Um, in, in terms of the churn of firms, there is some interest, um, not least because it's the, the, the number of new firms being created is an indicator uh, that local authorities and other economic generation, regeneration bodies can look at. Um, though you know, other advisors with whom, we, with whom we're working point out that this can be very misleading uh, and that you know, promoting growth of existing firms is likely to have a better overall outcome uh, than simply aiming to create new firms. Um, that, that's, that's the context. Um, I have to say that Delta itself doesn't model firms per se. We, we model sectors uh, and the employment in the sectors. Uh, what we do do is to recognize that within any one sector uh, and within any one area, uh, there may be churn going on. And hence, uh, it is quite, there is, not usually any kind of distance deterrence element so that uh, firms uh, can grow in one part of a city and decline in another, or at a larger scale in one city and decline in another mm. um, because of the changes in demand and we are agnostic as, as to whether that comes about uh, through new firms being formed here and closing there mm. or through F uh, firms that close branches in one place mm. and open or expand them in another uh, yeah. or through any other, other mechanism. Whereas with the population, we're conscious of that being a more or less constant set of people who are moving around uh, and there is a very distinct uh, distance deterrence process at work. But, okay, let's talk about the dreaded uh, uh, gentrification. Essentially, from a city point of view, it's perfect if you have richer people, wealthier people living in an area. Mm -hmm. But normally that becomes the bone of contention. So how can you justify, or how, how would we, should we address this issue that there will be new people coming in given the higher rents justified by higher accessibility? Let's focus on the transport side, or the higher rents justified by uh, putting in further amenities like parks or, or mm -hmm. other things. So how can we address this in a land use transport model? How should we go about this? Well, so there's a question of do we forecast it? Yes. And ha yes. How, how, how should we appraise it? Yes. What, what should we be advising clients yeah. about it? Um, we, we do get that effect uh, that higher accessibility uh, draws in higher income households uh, that leads to the increase in rent which itself displaces uh, lower income households uh, and it, in, in many cases uh, the increase in accessibility 
uh, is actually less valuable to them um, because they're not commuting or less likely to commuting to uh, central business district, which is where a lot of these scheme on which a lot of these schemes are focused. Um, we are. I guess we're getting to the point where we can at least point out the effects of this uh, to clients by uh, applying the uh, welfare calculations that I mentioned uh, in uh, another in discussion of an, one of the earlier presentations, uh, which are going from a move from classic consumer surplus calculations uh, that are done in transport, uh, where you have uh, consumer surplus estimates based on numbers of trips and generalized cost uh, to those based on uh, numbers of households and the utility of living in the zone. Uh, and so we, we can point out uh, that for low-income households in particular zones, uh, the benefit of uh, improved accessibility uh, may be small or, in the case of retired households, negligible, um, and that the disbenefit uh, at least to those who are in the property market um, of higher rents will be considerable. Uh, so we, we, we can at least point this out. Um, where, you know, what weight the, the client gives to that as a downside um, uh, is, is, is another question again. There's also the question of to, to what extent, if it's a transport investment that's going to come in at a particular point, then there may be a marked change in the fortune of particular areas. If we're looking at the effect of other policies that work gradually, then it may be that there's no sharp loss to anybody at any point, that they will do different things over time. Um, the, the, the other thing that uh, has come out uh, is that th th there may be um, offsetting advantages. Uh, again, with Crossrail 2, what we found is that for retired households, uh, the benefit, there's negligible benefit in accessibility because they're not that often going to the central London, sometimes. Uh, but there is a benefit in terms of the environment uh, that of the, uh, the volume of traffic and, and negative impacts of traffic uh, that are removed from their neighbourhoods. And, and that can be much more important than the, the direct transport benefit. All right. Thank you very much, David. Time to move on. But thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you.